Greetings and salutations, everyone. Today we're going to take a look at the 1950s, an age that is commonly referred to as an affluent society. Affluent means that you have money, that you have means, that your ability to do is not hindered by resources. So let's get started. The 50s are considered this kind of golden age for Americana, the idea of a, a amazing time, the war is over, the economy is good, jobs are prosperous, and for most people, this was a very great time to be alive. The concept, the term affluent society was coined by economist uh, John Galbraith, who said that this is a time where there is enough and more than enough. Most people's income on average is going to triple between 1940 and 1960. There's a huge boom in home ownership. Farms are more efficient. Factories are more efficient. And with that, you don't need as many people doing factory labor what we usually call blue collar jobs. Instead, we can have more business work, white collar jobs. And this change is gonna to start to happen during this time period. The Cold War fueled a reason to make the economy stronger. We had to make more stuff, make new stuff, because we had to wage a war with the Soviets that wasn't about how many guns we had, but about who was right. And in capitalism, the old saying is, the person with the most to who dies with most toys wins. And we see that the center of farming and production is gonna continue to shift west. We see that there is an ease of labor conflict that start to exist. The idea of working 10 hour days, six days a week had been the norm in this country for so long, but thanks to good union work, as well as combination coming together of different unions, this starts to end. And unionized workers, even if you're a blue collar, you could, live a very, very comfortable life at this time, needing nothing more than barely a high school education. The big thing that pushed the growth of the economy during this time was the building of the suburbs, home ownership. If you look at any point in American history, Owning land, owning property, that is akin to being successful. In some cases, that was the way you could vote. That was the way you were prosperous. And during this time, the suburbs will be created. A place that's near enough the t big city that you can still be part of it, but rural enough that you're not engaged in it every day. And some of these early suburbs, the best example of one of the early ones was Levittown. And this was in upstate New York. And it was a home building company that just mass produced homes. And they really weren't that different. Once you had the model set, you built house A, B, C, or D. And in Levittown's mass produced areas, that was it, it was house A, house B, house B, C, house D. And it was the same thing. With there being no differentiation in the planning, the cost goes way down. The GI Bill had made homes affordable for soldiers who are now veterans. And in the 1950s, we see this huge baby boom. The birth rate just explodes between 45 and 61. Wars had delayed marriages, wars had, I'll miss you, sweetheart, I can't wait to see you again. And then, you know, the sweetheart comes home and nine months later, they have a little bundle of joy with it. Now you've got house models A, B, and C right there, $8,500 for a brand new house. But suburbia was definitely still affected by segregation. There was barriers that were created 
for who you could sell a house to or even resell a house to. And in some cases, the federal government stepped in to say, you cannot sell a house to someone who is not white. The fear was that if you did, the value of the house would deteriorate, their value of the neighborhood would collapse. The 50s also see a return to consumerism. We saw consumerism really start to show up at the dawn of the 20th century, big in the 1920s, but the idea is you have more money, so you might as well spend a little more money. And if you're going to have the new toy, you might be might as well be a nice toy. When it came out of the out of the Second World War, you rationed everything. So you went for years on without a washing machine, without a dishwasher, without a refrigerator. And now that there are more of these things and they're cheaper and everyone's making more money, you start doing that. TV starts replacing newspaper as the way people are going to start getting their information. And early on, TV, as far as news went, it was this is the events that happened. Just very basic, non-biased. But when it came to entertainment, TV was bland. It was the same 30-minute program you could find on any network. They changed the actors. They changed what town they're living in. And that's it. Uh, there was no differentiation from this. But it was more effective also in um, advertising. So news and advertising really is what TV dominated. TV started growing so much that families just start eating in front of the TV for the first time ever. Can you imagine something so um, startling? It created new ways to eat, the TV dinner, the TV tray. Oh my goodness, this way you could just, you know, have your food and not have to worry about missing a minute of Leave it to Beaver. TV also caused a decline in people going to the movies because there's no reason to go to a theater if you could watch something in your own home. So theaters start making it incentive to come to the theater, come here for the door prizes, come here and the, the first hundred people collect some commemorative dishes. 3D movies was the, ooh, look at that, we got to go see the giant attack monster in 3D. We see that studios create the blockbuster film, the movie that would cost so much, be larger than life, something that could never be seen on TV the same way as it could on film. Radio audiences will also drop off due to television. Uh, radio stations are going to slowly start to specialize in the kinds of music, the kinds of entertainment they're going to have. Prior to about 1948, if you just turn on the radio, you could hear anything. In the same 24-hour segment, you might hear folk music, a religious revival, and a country western channel. That was realistic to what you might hear. But over time, you'd have the country station, the revivalist station, the folk station, and people start tuning in more when they want to hear a specific genre. And with the inventor of a transistor, the radio becomes much smaller. During the World War II years, women worked while men were at war. When the men came back, there was the question of, okay, what happens with these women? And the first answer was, well, now that the men are all back, they clearly need to not work anymore. And there's a brief drop off of women working, and then it starts to pick up and rise again. The nature of women working, though, has changed. The idea was if a woman wanted to work for a little while until she got married and had kids, then that was okay. And with the baby, when the baby boom happened, that really drove a lot of women out of the workplace. And they might not return until kids are old enough to take care of themselves, teenagers or maybe even later. The new 
genre of music that starts to be defined during this time is the idea of rock and roll. And it starts when this disc jockey named Alan Freed sees these white kids dancing to African-American rhythm and blues albums and thinks, you know, we can just we can make this a thing in a broader spectrum. You just have to rebrand it. You have to remarket it. And that's where the idea of rock and roll comes from. If you put it on the radio and says, here's rhythm and blues music, and you have what is essentially rock and roll, white kids would, you know, they'd listen to it, but the parents, oh my God, we couldn't possibly listen to something like this. And they turn it off, but rebranding made it different. We see our big rock and roll stars like Elvis Presley changed how everyone saw the music industry. And he was so outlandish that he was banned from recording for a while. The generation gap in music also created the beatniks, the beatnik poet, the beat poet, somebody who might be an artist on the outside of society, someone who might put together a idea of our generation is different than my parents' generation because dot, dot, dot. Then you put that idea to a song. Maybe you tap it out on some bongo drums. Maybe you hum it in a cafe. And voila, you have a movement. Unfortunately, African-American entertainers are really not as accepted as other entertainers, as white entertainers. We see that the big voices of Chuck Berry, Little Richard, the Drifters, uh, the Supremes, they had huge impact, in some cases, huger impacts. But because of race, they were not appreciated as much at that time. Some people worried that the 50s, rec well, they represented an end of one way of thinking that the old ways were going away, that this new generation with their instant gratification and their rock and roll music was just gonna cause trouble and they were going to lead to the collapse of freedoms. And it was easy for people to want to see this because you had so many people, well, you had people come back from the war and want to continue a certain type of actions. Uh, if you see so many people being born all at once, they're going to start thinking in a different way, especially when there's such a large number of people. With everything changing, this social division over generations really is no surprise. In 1952, Truman is out of office. He has now been president for long enough. He cannot run again. And the Republicans decide to nominate Dwight Eisenhower. This is big because Dwight Eisenhower was Supreme Allied Commander during the war in, in the European theater. The argument was, hey, he can run the army, so clearly he can run a country. And in regards to Korea, he promises to end the war in Korea, which had started at this little before this, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes. And the Democrats nominate Adelaide Stevens. He was, what you see is what you get. He was unpretentious, he was witty, he was down to earth, he was relatable. In the end, people went with Eisenhower. And this was significant for a couple of reasons. Number one, this was the first Republican president in office since 1932. So it's been 20 years that the Democrats have controlled the office of the presidency. One of the things that Eisenhower starts doing very quickly is he puts more local control into the government affairs. He is willing to let go of some of the controls of government that had been held for so long. He says, we're going to cut federal spending, we're going to balance the budget, we're going to cut taxes. And we see that Social Security is extended to millions of people 
while at the same time, education money is cut. Uh, and this is where we see that federal support for education goes away, but highways will be built more. The highway infrastructure that we have now existed because of Eisenhower. He said one of the big problems was in drafting so many people for World War II was it could take you weeks to get from your home to a recruitment center. And this entire system was created in just a few years. All the different components to it. I mean, some stuff that are so simple, you don't even realize it's going on. If you are on I-35, for example, that goes north and south. All your odd numbered highways go north, south. All your even number highways go east, west. Mile markers start getting put up because, well, if you didn't know exactly where you were, you could say, well, I just passed, you know, exit 36 or mile 125. And if you need to call for help, that was it. Even this little thing, ooh, hickey, you know, where's your gas gauge? Oh, that's where your gas door is. That's neat. We have grown up with highway culture. It has always been part of America. So the past seven decades, from highways to truck stops to the thing, the thing you have to stop and see when you're traveling through the middle of nowhere. Sure, it's gimmicky. Sure, it's a tourist trap. But when you see advertisements for the thing, a hundred miles out, after you've been seeing this for so long, you really gotta know what is the thing. Hotel, motel, holiday inn. Eisenhower's new military approach is known as the new look. And he felt that containment was just too expensive to last for very long. It was too ineffective. You're spending tons of money on a potential threat with no real yes and here's our victory moment. You can point to something. So he decides on a new idea where he is going to emphasize us using nuclear weapons. The threat of using nuclear weapons, Eisenhower believed, would be enough to deter people from wanting to go to war. If you were to cause some trouble and the United States threatens, hey, knock it off or we're going to start dropping nukes on you, you might be convinced, wow, that's scary. I'm not going to do this. And this is called brinkmanship. This is a type of conflict that's known as brinkmanship, where you are bringing the conflict right to the brink of war. The problem with brinkmanship obviously is if you are always doing it and you never follow through with deploying nuclear weapons someone's gonna think hey wait what's going on and yeah now despite the prosperity that we see in the 50s there are still lots of people who are living below the poverty line and in the work in uh, Harrington's work, The Other America, it showed how poor Americans can be. It showed stories of single mothers or the elderly. It showed the stories of minority immigrants who were living on almost nothing. And I mean, you can see in this picture the family that is here. You have six people, or one, two, three, four, five kiddos, mom and dad wallpaper is made of newspaper a single light hangs in the middle of the room this is not the affluent america with so many people leaving urban america to go into suburbs and with the barriers that existed for minorities to buy a house in suburbia we have an event known as white flight that happens where so again, lots of white people are leaving the big cities and minority groups are all that is left in some of these or anyone who can't afford to move. Some towns, some big cities tried doing urban renewal programs to fight poverty. They tear down the poorest slums and in exchange build these high rise apartments. The problem of this is, if I couldn't afford to move into a house and my home is torn down, I'm not gonna be able to move into this new high-rise apartment either. And we see a huge bump 
in homelessness as well. Northern cities, African Americans especially, are where we're going to see problems are going to exist for. Um, people who could go into factories, we start seeing that this shift away from factory work is hindering those folks as well. One minority group that probably had it worse was the Native Americans. Uh, on average, they had an income of almost $1,000 less than African Americans. And even by the 50s, even with Native American policies that finally allowed for voting and granting of citizenship, the federal government still wants Native Americans to assimilate, to act more white. And the policy of terminating tribal lands was disastrous. Some of our poorest white communities are going to be located in Appalachia, the mountainous region of the Appalachians on the East Coast. This is part of the country that didn't get electricity and running waters in their homes until the 30s. Unemployment is high. You have very poor school systems, very poor infrastructure. And this is just terrible. We see a rise in juvenile delinquency too. And the big thing that these kiddos would go do, and you can look at those two kids there sitting smoking, is not that they're smoking cigarettes or you know being teenagers and doing this. Uh, the top crime for these kids would be stealing of cars. And you know, wow, that's a that's a felony right there. And most of these kids are not growing up poor. Most of these kids come from middle class backgrounds. It's just another way to either A, rebel, or B, I'm bored. We finally detonate a hydrogen bomb in 1952. Truman said we were going to get after it in 48. It took a while to develop it. Uh, and the first hydrogen bomb we utilized was a thousand times more powerful than the bomb detonated at Hiroshima. And six months later, the Soviets do the same thing, and it's, well, that didn't work. The goal of building the hydrogen bomb was to maintain nuclear supremacy. So now the question is, let's just build more bombs so we can deploy more if we need to. And that was, that led to a scary arms race. In 1953, Joseph Stalin dies and Nikita Khrushchev takes over as premier of the Soviet Union, basically president of the Soviet Union. And he, when he came to power, he was a good person to come to power for the Soviets. He had a military background. He had served in World War II. He had been a party member since the 30s. And infamously, at the 1955 Communist Party rally, he says, and this is basically in front of the whole world, how bad it was under Stalin. He talks about the purges that Stalin did, the black cars that would abduct people, the people who were just sent to gulags and prisons, the people who were shot in their own homes by Stalin's secret police. And this was something that inside of Russia, people knew about but you didn't talk about it because you know you didn't want to get abducted and killed and when the fact that Khrushchev is discussing all this stuff it for the rest of the world was the oh my goodness we we did we knew it was bad we didn't know it was that bad and Khrushchev ends this with the statement that the Soviet Union is going to make the biggest jumps for science and technology that the world had ever seen. And the rest of the world thinks, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Good luck with that. Eisenhower, as president, came to believe that the Soviets were reasonable. And he comes to power at about the same time Khrushchev comes to power. And Khrushchev says we should try to coexist peacefully. Neither one of us is going anywhere. No one wants nuclear war. 
Eisenhower believes that everyone can work together and and it works. In 58, we see the two superpowers sit down together and both agree to stop testing atmospheric nuclear weapons. Following World War II, the old European empires start to collapse. Decolonization of South Asia, Southeast Asia, even the African colonies all start to go away at this time. And it's in these third world nations, these left, well, the leftovers of these empires, some of them turn into overnight powerhouses, others do not. And in some of these cases where the economy is very weak, the political system is very corrupt, and there's no social infrastructure at all, you have the third world or the developing world. This is where capitalism and communism would kind of fight to control and see what would happen. This map right here references when we say third world, developing world, where we typically think. The gray nations are usually considered developed nations. The yellow nations are sometimes considered third world, and the green nations are usually considered the third world. During World War II, Latin America was the place to get all the grown foods, especially uh, because of where it's located. And we buy up anything we can because, to supplement the foods that we have to send soldiers, as well as economic aid within the Americas. But as the Cold War went on, the United States isn't buying as much, isn't spending as much in this region. And the region had kind of come to rely on outside purchases of this stuff. When that doesn't happen, the reactionary governments start taking more power and we see dictatorships start to pop up or we see gang lords start to have more power than the government. It really starts getting bad in, uh, for example, Guatemala. In 1954, the Guatemalan government starts importing Soviet weapons. And we are really worried that Mr. Arbenz, the president of Guatemala, was going to side his nation with the Soviet Union and eventually become another communist state. We were so worried that this was going to happen that we send money to Honduras. We send weapons to Honduras, which is a neighboring nation of Guatemala. And under a month later, our Benz is dead and his government has been overthrown. And this was a really obvious what had happened situation. Um, th there's not a lot of, hmm, I wonder how this transpired. I wonder how our Benz, I wonder how Guatemala, I wonder what happened with Nicaragua. No, it's about as obvious as you can put together. Uh, and things got worse. Our relations with part of Latin America decreased pretty quick. Uh, in fact, when Vice President Richard Nixon went to Latin America on a goodwill tour in 58, he actually had to cut it short from two weeks to two days because there was fear he was not going to survive. The Nazis and the Jews are two are stories that we have told time and again with the idea that something like this should never happen again. The Nazis killed six million Jewish people. And Jews have had a, a rough history. I mean, you can look at any part of history that concerns Jewish people and it usually does not end well for them. They had always believed that there was a homeland that was to be gifted to them by uh, their God. And after seeing, you know, this horrible atrocity committed against them, in 1947, the UN acts to take the nation of Palestine and to partition it, uh, cut it up, so that part of the nation will become the new Jewish homeland of Israel. And this is a process, and you can see in this chart here, that from 1947 to 2000, the nation of Israel has 
kind of fought with and deterred and increased land until we have problems that exist now. When Israel was born, the Arab neighbors did not like the idea that this had happened. And in 49, the armies of Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon all attack Israel. And the Israelis, you know, you can look at this from a number of nations, as a number of soldiers, as a number of, wow, that's a lot. They were really outnumbered. The difference is that the United States had been one of the first nations to ally with Israel, and the United Nations had done a lot to make sure that they were going to be a stable state. So despite the fact that the Israelis were hugely outnumbered, they were way better organized and way better armed than the other five nations. In Eastern Europe, the fighting of the Soviets had kind of started to escalate. Um, the fear was that the Soviets were strong within the Soviet Union, and there was slowly opposition parties outside of Eastern Europe. We were putting nuclear missiles close to the Soviet Union. We had U.S. bases in Europe, North Africa, and Turkey that had nuclear missiles, nuclear bombs that could have been deployed if it felt it needed to. The reality of this fear was that the Soviets were not strong enough technologically. This was proven horrendously wrong in 1957 when the Soviets launched the first satellite into orbit, Sputnik 1. For the first time ever, man had sent something that had left the Earth, and the Soviets had done this. It was a shock to everyone because no one thought they had the scientific know-how, the technological capabilities, and with so much outside pressure on them, they're still able to do something like this. And immediately, the rest of the world is put into the place of, the Soviets are not in this dangerous place anymore. They are able to do this. The United States responds by saying, okay, well, we'll We'll do that too. And a race for space, a race for technological supremacy began. The Soviets win a lot of the early achievements. They have the first thing in space, Sputnik 1. They put the first animal in space, like the dog. They put the first human in space, Yuri Gergen. They put the first three-man team into space. They put the first woman into space. And at the end, we point our fingers at the moon and say, okay, that's it. That's our next one. Whoever gets there first, quote unquote, wins. That was a technological hurdle that was considered so huge that no one would be able to do it. And it wasn't until 1969 that we did land people on the moon, effectively ending the space race. While this technological one-upping each other on Earth did lead to space travel, it also created some real interesting spy planes. One of them was the U-2, this very large spy plane that was thought to, that could fly so high and fly so fast that there was nothing the Soviets had that could see it, let alone shoot it down. And you know, we kind of felt gutsy with using this thing, so we used it to spy on them pretty frequently until in May 1st, 1960, one of these planes actually is shot down, and we think, oh dear, that's that's bad. That's really bad. Well, we'll just say that it was a rogue pilot, and that's what the U.S. immediately did. Said so it was a rogue pilot. He, he took the plane. We, we, we Terrible, horrible things, and you know, this thing flies so high, flies so fast, the fact that it's shot down and crashes, we're thinking there is no way this guy survived, but oh dear, he did. And he is taken out onto Soviet TV, and he, you know, he says, yes, I, my name is so-and-so, and, -so, and, I, 
am an American pilot. I was sent to spy on the Soviet Union and, oh God. In 1959, in Cuba, we see a nationalist revolution take place. And it's begun by this guy, Fidel Castro. He overthrows the dictator of Cuba's government and very quickly Eisenhower recognizes that, you know, okay, Castro, your government is the legitimate government. Uh, Batista, he was a despot and a dictator and hey, don't forget, we're your friends. But Castro had not liked the United States, uh, emphatically did not like the United States. He blamed American profiteering off Cuban sugar, Cuban tobacco, and he he confiscates the American property there, saying it's ours because it's here. And when he starts negotiating trade deals with the Soviets in February of 1960, we just flat out prohibit anyone from buying or selling with Cuba. No Americans could. And the thought of it was, if no one is buying this stuff, then then Castro's government would collapse, and he the communist forces here that would be changed. The problem is everyone likes sugar. Everyone who is addicted to tobacco knows what that is like to have to go without. So it's easy enough for Castro to find other people to buy his stuff. After 1945, the question of racial equality in this country started to look more like backseat, like we'll deal with these communists first. And there was big race problems, there was big prejudicial problems that happened in this country during this time for race. The rise of ending segregation actually started during this time as well. It should start before this time. Plessy versus Ferguson was a Supreme Court case that said the nation could legally segregate people by race, by color of your skin, if there was an equal option for both sides. This is why it's separate but equal. In 1938, the University of Missouri has a law school, but not for African American students and the state was sued for this and they had to create it. In 1948, same thing in Oklahoma. In 1950 at the University of Texas, we see once again, there's one guy who applied for law school, but UT didn't have facilities for a African-American law school. So this guy, He's in law school and he is just not allowed, he's enrolled in law school, he's enrolled in the classes, but he's not allowed to actually sit in the room. So he has to take his class, he has to take a desk into the hall and just learn from there while a professor is lecturing. The big decision for ending segregation was when we look at the heroes of ending it, we look at women like women like um, Rosa Parks, but there's somebody who came before who did the same thing, and that was Claudette Colvin. March 2nd, 1955, Claudette Colvin is arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a bus. And she is arrested, she is taken to prison. Uh, later she meets she actually meets and works with Rosa Parks, who is secretary of the NAACP. And the local chapter of the NAACP looks at this and says, this is horrible, this is terrible. We can't let this thing go on. But they didn't want to use her as the voice and face of, of this movement because number one, she's 15. Number two, she was pregnant. And number three, and this was actually from their argument, she was very, very, she's a kid. You can't do this stuff to a kid. 
but he could do it with an adult. December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks does the same thing. And this leads to the bus boycott of Montgomery. This is going to cement the movement in a very specific direction. The bus boycott of Montgomery, Alabama was led by Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Leadership Christian Conference. These two groups were responsible for telling people, hey, we're not riding the bus, we're drawing attention to the segregation thing. And, and for over a year, the bus boycott went on. Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. was someone who started his work to fight segregation fight racism from a very young age. His grandfather was a protester and King believed that the best way to fight this movement was nonviolently, was through the ideas that Gandhi had done, that fighting back would create more problems. He said that this is not a fight between white and black, but a fight between justice and injustice. That bus boycott lasted 381 days. Some employers were willing to work with the people who were striking, other employers would not. There was uh, carpools that were created. Very briefly, there was a African-American owned bus company, um, but it, it went bankrupt and this was such a hit to the Montgomery bus companies that they are kind of forced to change their policies. It's not the end of segregation, but it's a good step towards ending segregation. The bigger story was a national court case of Brown versus Board of Education. And the Brown family lived just on the outskirts of Topeka, Kansas. Under the laws of separate but equal, the school district had to bus in every kid. And the Brown family was African-Americans who lived just at the edge of town. The district didn't have another bus to send to pick up one kid that far out. So the district refused to bus in the kid. The family, they don't like this. They sue the district. The local court sides with the district. It is appealed. And this is where the NAACP sends in one of their strongest, most well-versed constitutional scholars to fight for this, Thurgood Marshall. He challenges that separate but equal just doesn't work and you're creating an entire system that is based on on this broken system and if you're going to do it with an adult that's one thing but you're doing it with children in 1955 the court agrees the supreme court sides with the naacp and the brown family and orders that with all deliberate speed schools will integrate the problem with that is with all deliberate speed is not by a specific date. It could be by January 1. It could be by the start of the next school year. It could be by next week. So you could look at this and interpret it whatever you wanted. In 1957, in Arkansas, Little Rock opens up a brand new high school, Central Park High. And nine African-American kiddos were said, you know, hey, this is gonna be your school. We're gonna slowly start integrating. But the governor of Arkansas, Orville Faubus, was so against this, he calls in the National Guard to prevent these kids from going to school. And when Eisenhower hears about this, you know, later that night, the nightly news, he sends the paratroopers in 
He says the National Guard who had gone in, yeah, this is not a thing you need to actually do. And the soldiers who are sent in by the president are stationed with the students all day long. Every room, every hallway, every entrance, every exit. The soldiers take the kids to school, make sure they get home safely every day for an entire school year. In 1960, Eisenhower is run his two terms and he recommends for president his vice president, Richard Milhouse Nixon. And Nixon had a, he was a lawyer, he had fought against commies uh, as, this, as a senator, he had a long, really prestigious political career, and the Democrats put up the senator from Massachusetts, John Kennedy. And these two guys could not have been more different. You have age versus experience. And Kennedy had served in World War II and was a war hero. But because he was younger and because he was Catholic, and this was a time where that was a deciding factor more than anything else, that was it. Kennedy chooses as his running mate, his rival from Texas, Lyndon Bain Johnson. And these two guys were oil and water. They never got along with anything, but they were both willing to work together for this common goal. And for a lot of people, when they saw that, it was, oh, wow, that's a big thing. At his election, Kennedy showed little interest in civil rights movements. He said that Eisenhower had gone behind um, in de defending this nation with new missiles. And then on the campaign trip, he uses his the fact that he's younger than Nixon by a good couple decades, that he has new passion, new direction, then Nixon. And people are thinking, they, this guy might be onto something. He is a totally different fellow. And then you have the very first televised debate between these two. And this isn't just the first televised debate between Nixon and Kennedy. This is the first televised debate between two presidential nominees. And boy, howdy, was it a thing. Uh, Kennedy had kind of grown up with cameras around him. His dad had been a Hollywood movie producer and they had taken lots of Hollywood home style home videos. So he knew how to work a camera. He knew how to work an audience. And in this, he is giving poignant arguments. He's giving detailed thought and Nixon is giving yes, no responses. So anyone who's watching this thinks, wow, Kennedy's younger and has a different perspective than the old establishment, but he also knows what he's talking about. On election night, Kennedy wins the popular vote by only 100,000 votes, but he creams it in the electoral votes. Taking the presidency in a new direction, a direction it had not been in. So, Today we took a look at the 1950s, the tremendous amount of information that happened with an affluent society, with the Cold War, with the Soviets, the space race, with civil rights, all of this. Hope you learned something today. I'll see you next time.